Good evening, everybody. Uh, and I've also brought with me Joel Gurr. So Joel is one of my directors who looks at day by day after Fremantle Hospital. Uh, as you can tell from the accent, I'm not local. So uh, I've been over here now for about five months. So I am still finding my way. It's my first time in the town hall, etc. But I have actually moved into Fremantle, so I do class myself as a little bit of a local. Um, clearly, Fremantle Hospital has a huge heritage. Okay, and that was obvious to me because I took two weeks before I started work, and even just walking through uh, the town and talking to locals, because I'm a bit boring. I always talk about hospitals at all I do all my life. And uh, just talking to people, there's obviously the passion people feel for Fremantle Hospital. Uh, and that's really important that we recognise that. Equally, it's really important that we also recognise that the way we are able to look after patients now is developing very considerably. And I look back to, uh, even only the, you, know, you go back to Roman times, life expectancy for males then was only around 50. You go back to the Second World War, if you were alive then the Second World War, it was around 67, 68. They tell me the first person to live to 200 has already been born. And 10% of children born this year and last year will probably live to about 150. Now that's not because we're just eating five a day and everything else. Uh, it's because medical technology is improving all of the time. And that's a really good thing. And I think back to the troubles my father went through when he was alive, and he became what we call a frequent flyer. He was in that hospital all the time, but he had Parkinson's. He's coped with that for about 25 years. He had cancer twice. Uh, he had dementia in the end, a number of other things. And if I go back 30 years, he would not have survived as long as he did. And that's a really positive thing for myself and my family, and I think it's a positive thing for most patients. But that technology becomes more and more specialist. And often I've had the debate in the UK uh, about uh, services. So what we did in the UK, we centralised where we deliver our cancer services from, for example. And a lot of the debate at the time was, yes, but my local hospital used to be able to deliver me that care. But part of the specialist in nature is a little bit like riding a bicycle. If anybody ride bicycles? But if you ride one every 10 years, you probably won't be as proficient as if you ride one every day. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. If you do a task. And there is something about that and the specialist nature of the work. So what we can't do is continue to deliver everything in every hospital as it's always been placed. Because what we used to do years ago in those hospitals is very different now. So we're trying to get the balance between Fiona Stanley and Fremantle Hospital. So I'm responsible for both hospitals. And I often call it the Fremantle and Fiona Stanley Hospitals intentionally to remind everybody in Fiona that actually that's not the only place for our two hospitals. It's fair to say, I think, that when Fiona Stanley was opened, there were a lot of changes in plans, and, and not just within the hospital's gift. Uh, was Royal Perth going to close? Was it going to stay open? What was going to happen to Fremantle, etc.? But I, one gift I have never been given all my life, and I always wanted was a time machine, but I haven't got it. So I can't go back and make that good. But what I can do is try with my experience and with the colleagues I work with, and with the uh, patients that we work with and the, the communities, is to develop Fremantle back into a state-of-the-art facility for the right services. So it will never become a heart transplant centre because that's just impossible. If we did that there, our outcomes for patients would be diabolical because it would not be sufficiently uh, robust to deliver that type of service. However, we are developing the services already. Uh, we obviously have aged mental health and adult mental health there. Now those facilities are constantly being looked at and where we can, we will continue to improve them and we'll keep working on those services, because they're really important. We deliver elective surgery, so that's planned surgery. So we haven't got an A&E there, or an ED. Um, but what we do is people who have planned operations, so you go to GP and they say, yes, you need a hip replace, or you need some plastic surgery, whatever else it is. So for orthopedics, we do a lot of orthopedics still there. Uh, for uh, ophthalmology, we do all of our ophthalmology there, because really good centre. 
Uh, we're we have been doing some plastics, and we're going to continue to grow that. We've now started ENT, and we weren't doing that before, so that's a new one. Uh, and there'll be others, such as Gyne, which we're starting very shortly. So we'll grow those elective services, but we won't be able to do it for every specialty. And the reason for that is there's a limited number of theatres. And what won't work is if you have an orthopedic team, or sorry, a theatre team, and those theatre nurses, in the morning they're doing gynae, in the afternoon they're doing orthopedics, the next morning they're going to do some more plastics, and the next afternoon they do some neurology, and the next morning let's put them onto something like ophthalmology, because it's a bit like riding a bicycle. <laughs> you don't become sufficiently proficient. And the key thing is to get really good patient outcomes. That's where I measure our success. Really good patient outcomes. And for me, the patient outcomes are only three simple things. We've got to deliver you the safest care possible. Uh, and I've never had a letter of compliment in my life for delivering safe care. And then when I flew here, I thought, well, actually, I never wrote to the airline and said, thanks for not crashing. <laughs> I expected it. And you should expect that when you come to a hospital. I'm not saying we get it right every time because we have a lot of people go through it. We're pretty much like small towns, our hospitals. But we aim to get as safe as possible. But being safe isn't the only reason we go to hospital. You also get so hopefully we can improve the outcome of your care. Okay? And therefore we need to make sure whatever we do is effective. Now effective to me means making sure that we constantly look around the world to see if there's a better way to do it. And if there's a better way to do it, we adapt and we change and we follow the best practice. Those two things learn. Again, effectiveness, I've never had a letter of compliment about effectiveness. And I've never written to an airline and said, thanks for stopping at the right airport. I just expect them to do it. The third thing that differentiates a good hospital and a really great hospital is the patient experience. And that's something we will continue to drive, uh, drive and strive to improve. Because a patient experience is not only important in terms of politeness and dignity, it's really important actually in terms of your improvement in healthcare. If anybody goes into an environment where you don't feel very safe as a hospital, I suspect your recovery time will be longer. Okay? Uh, There's proven evidence through all the research. If we make sure you're, you're safe, you feel secure, you feel you've been looked after by compassionate staff, etc your recovery will be better for you. So that patient experience is critical as well. The third area of care that we're going to do up, so we've got the mental health and we've got the elective sur surgery, is our care of the elderly facilities. Now, care of the elderly is split across the two sites at the moment. And I often tell the story of Horace. And Horace is a genuine patient, but I wouldn't use his second name for uh, personal reasons. I met Horace about four weeks ago in one of our six D wards in Piano Standard. He's in room nine and he was sat in a chair. And Horace was waiting to be transferred to Fremantle Hospital through our transit lounge. So the transit lounge, we often have patients come in the morning, we don't have all our discharge in the afternoon, and there's a clash. So what we try and do where appropriate, we move patients to a very secure nursed area called a transit lounge. Um, and Horace was sitting there at 10 in the morning and I came back at three, he was still sitting there, which is unacceptable. And apparently was transferred about seven o'clock that night. And I did a bit of digging and I found out Horace had actually been uh, in ED first, our emergency department, for a good while. And then they moved into what we call those uh, AMU, our acute medical unit. And then they got busy, so they moved him somewhere else. And then finally they moved him towards 60, and then we moved him to Fremantle. And that is just not acceptable. There are too many moves. So what I'm planning to do, and we'll work it through with teams to make sure we get it right, so it won't happen tomorrow, but it will happen fairly shortly, is we'll look to reduce those number of moves. So Horace can come in, he has to, to ED, and he can move into the appropriate bed as quickly as possible, which will be probably free mental. If he's extremely unstable and needs lots of very other specialist interventions, <coughs> so he's cancer, etc., then we can't move him. But for the majority of those patients, Fremantle will be an ideal site because actually it's a more sociable interaction takes place there than you do in single state-of-the-art ensuite rooms. If that makes sense. So that's why we're looking at that couple. So our plans are to make those excellent services. Not second-rate services, but excellent services. 
Um, the environment is the environment. Uh, I, I don't come with a fat wallet, dollars, to change it. But within the resources I have available to me, to me, I will make the best use for all of our patients across both campuses. So let me stop talking, because otherwise I'll just talk and talk and I won't answer your <coughs> questions, which is important. So shall I just ask for any questions from the audience? Yes. I found that extremely interesting having been interested in the whole duality. Going back some 30, 40 years and more, there was a conference on health facilities, and it was decided then that the really important thing was to have not every hospital with all the bells and whistles, but the minimum that was necessary for the area. In this light, I would wonder if it's possible to have a Fremantle hospital like a Bush hospital, an accident and emergency unit, which accepts people from the area who find it much too hard to get to the owner's family and therefore they end up somewhere else in a chaotic situation. We have the Friday night brawlers, we have the long grasses, you may not know the term, but it's <coughs> 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 and there's a lot. <coughs> However, if we had, like a bush hospital, people come in, they're assessed, it's a triage unit, and they say, okay, you need a band aid, you need to sober up, you're mm -hmm. serious, off to go and stand. Now, this, in my view, would take pressure off the own stand these <coughs> and it would also make Fremantle Hospital that bit more community-based. Okay. That's so, the, I, I understand the sentiment. <coughs> um, I have to be honest with the facts. It's 10 kilometres. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've come from an environment whereby 100 kilometres were not unusual to get a, a tertiary centre. But I appreciate that's not here. That's over in the UK. Um, and in the bush you're talking about hundreds of kilometres. The difficulty with the model you're talking about in practical terms is one, it would need to have consultants in the ED. Um, a consultant would not train for 15 years to just deal with drugs and band-aids. They would want to do the specialist work. So therefore, the ambulances are then faced with a choice. You've got a patient who's had a heart attack, is it Fiona? But Fremantle's only around the corner. Bring them to Fremantle, you haven't got all the other special support services, and therefore all of that would pass. The problem with hospitals is they're all built around several core specialties. So an ED has to have a general surgical service, which means it has to have on-call consultants permanent there. It, it does, so that, that's part of the problem. You then need general medical, <coughs> you then need cardiology, you then need other services. And so the problem with the a &E is actually, whilst the front door appears to most of us, because fortunately most of us actually just walk in because we've had an accident, for those unfortunately who come in an ambulance, often we'll need, need multidisciplinary teams to come and sort them. And if you haven't got that multidisciplinary team, then actually the ambulance will never stop. It has to take the patient to the quickest place where they will get the care. So I agree with you for drugs and band-aids, etc. It's ideal, but to actually staff it for that is actually incredibly difficult. So that, that's the only reason I think it's not practical. Could you not have a consultant that rotated through and just did stints? And surely it would take more pressure if you just had children who just needed a quick full time or somebody who needed an X-ray okay. and stuff. That and you just had a consultant like the Rockingham model many years ago. So and you had they just went there for a certain term. Yeah. <coughs> it just seems so practical to take yeah. pressure off the understanding. Yeah, but the difficulty is consultants don't just do stents and then do gen surgery and then do A and E and then no, do something no, else. So the reason our outcomes or the reason our outcomes our life expectancy is improving is because actually when I was a lad, people trained as doctors, a general surgeon would pretty much do everything. 
Now, if I go to orthopedics, there's a specialist for my right little finger, and there's a specialist for my left little finger. And medi- I exaggerate to make the point, because actually, medicine's like that. So stents are cardiologists, okay? We must have the general surgeons there because patients would come in for general surgery. We must have emergency teams there for overnight surgery because the ambulance has stopped. But, but because you have to have the full range of services. Otherwise, the ambulance crew, who are paramedics, cannot make those decisions through their assessment. As soon as the patient arrives, our consultants see the patient straight away. And they will, the AME doctor will do a full range of assessments and will call the on call teams immediately for everybody they need to. And there's probably about 15 specialties built around it. So often if you look at the developed world now, emergency departments, the emergency departments, have to be built into large tertiary centres. What about the Rockingham? The Rockingham has got a a relatively... No, 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 it's all right. I can talk about Rockingham because I know that. I don't really know Armada. (coughs) Rockingham has got a range of specialties. But it also operates almost like a large DGH, District General Hospital. Okay? It's a hugely expensive model for AED. And if we put it here, I would have to strip resources from Fiona. Because there isn't there aren't the volumes of patients to warrant both. And the cost for here will mean the services also at Fremantle, uh, Fiona would have to reduce. And the problem with that is then we're starting to get back into the let's spread our resources and not actually have all the specialist teams in one place for those who are the sickest. For those who need relatively straightforward things that you do, then there is primary care, there is pharmacy, etc. For those who need an ED in emergency, you have to have the full range of services. Sorry, you... I could just fill in a bit of history. In Kimberley, you had people who were sick and So, if we were to do something, we would have to do it at a very, very, very low acuity. You would not be able to include ambulance transfers, because that is just hugely dangerous. You cannot put a patient into an ambulance and stop a Fremantle and say, oops, we got this one wrong, let's put them in the ambulance again. It's just too dangerous, and I won't, personally, I won't countenance it, because I just can't do that. So you'd have to have it, basically what I'd call the walking wounded. For walking wounded, you could do that. It would be very minimal service. It would be most people who need primary care. It would be most people who need primary care, not acute care. And the impact on Fiona, in terms of volumes of patients, would be negligible. We have 300 patients attend ED every day. 75 are children. 75 are in ambulances. And 150 are what I'd call walk-ins. Of those walk-ins, around 15 a day from this catchment. For everybody else, actually, it's nearer to Fiona than to here. For those 15, you'd have to have a consultant. You'd need a backup consultant, because not every patient walks in actually is fine. 
Sometimes they actually collapse in the waiting room. So all I'm saying is the resources you require for those walking wounded actually come to very great expense. There are different models though, such as um, uh, you can have a minor injuries unit, etc. That's something that's developed in some, some countries. Minor injuries units are largely nurse-led. And they will deal with the types of patients you're talking about. I'm sorry to come in late. I'm a member for Fremantle, and Labor's policy was to open a urgent care clinic in Fremantle, which will be 24 hours. So perhaps you might let people know that as well, because well, I'm not sure. I, I, I can't talk about policy. Sorry, well, we're in government now. Yeah, so I appreciate you. Sorry, you can talk about that. I can't, I can't describe the process. I don't understand it enough because there are several around the world and they're all slightly different. But uh, if, if you could. Well, I just thought, it, I'm sorry I got here late, yeah. but I'm hearing the conversation is you know, the ED closed, um, what's the alternative? And we know we have the um, Fremantle Emergency GP Clinic. So Labor's policy was to open a series of urgent care clinics, which my understanding would be it's 24 hours, there will be one in Fremantle. We're not sure whether it'll be on the Fremantle Hospital campus because there's already a GP service there and we're not privy to that yeah. contract. But if possible, it'll be at the hospital and it'll be 24 hours and it'll be primarily, it'll be essentially primary care, yeah. perhaps with a bit extra yes. than just primary care. So it's more than a 24 hour um, many um, bulk build GP, it's, it's a bit extra staff, but it's not an ED. Yeah. So we took that to the election, and that is what will happen in the phone after. Yeah, I'm just saying what we're going on with ED. That's what I started. Sorry. So, yeah, I I'm sorry to keep the whole conversation, but I think that might address some of the issues. Okay, thank you. Very much. Yes. Well, just, just quickly, connected with that, you mentioned prior to all that <coughs> the Fremantle did provide primary care. The Fremantle Hospital does provide primary care. Can you describe how that is provided? What I'm saying is actually pretty much you go to any hospital in the world, a number of patients who arrive re require primary care. If you have a, I, I built a new hospital back in uh, North in England, and it was built on the south of the city, and the previous hospital was on the west of the city. And the hot spot where the emergencies came from moved you always get a number of people who live in the vicinity of the hospital who actually go there rather than go to primary care. Now, we don't turn patients away because they need care, they need care. So we try to see everybody. What I'm saying is, of your walk-in patients, there will always be a degree that are what I call primary care patients. They could seek alternative care. And if actually you lived an hour away, you would seek it normally than travelling that hour. But some people who live more locally will actually find it easier. Um, now, we try not to deliver primary care services, but if somebody walks in and they're ill, because patients who go to primary care are ill, we will actually try to do our best for that patient still. So, in terms of the cohort, you find that the number will be extremely ill, you'll find some that are moderately ill, there'll be some that are relatively unwell. Uh, you always get a cohort, so there'll be different elements of care required. Yes, sir. John. <coughs> ah, um, John Strachan, the Council of the Sea of I'm just going to shift the focus a little bit, not because I don't believe that all the questions so far have been valid and, and important, um, but from a, a council point of view, we saw that the demand of free natural hospital across the firm understanding actually sucked a lot of energy out of free mental the loss of staff, etc, etc. Now, I hear a lot of rumours about Fremantle Hospital having huge areas that are empty. I'd be really interested to know what sort of percentage of the current hospital is utilised and which is held empty, and what the vision is for the future for um, those places that currently are not being used. George, you have the percentages? It's probably not as uh, much as you think. We've actually moved a lot of areas and consolidated a lot of areas, but what we're looking with some of that spare space is to lease it out to either government or non-government organisations. So we're in lots of conversations with different parties around getting that space used. 
So I think that's going to be really important because as we've found other tenants have come onto the site, it just adds a, a lot more vibe and morale around the site. So for acute services, undoubtedly a number of services left the site when Fiona opened, there's no doubt about that. A number of staff transferred to Fiona. What we're now trying to do, as I said earlier, is to rebuild the services appropriately so they're the best ones, state-of-the-art care for those cohorts. So that's what I said, mental health, care of the elderly, and those six surgical areas will allow it to grow again. And the numbers of patients going through Fremantle have started to rise again. So that's our intention, John. Thank you. Um, just on that point, there is a lot of wards that are like graveyards yeah. at Freo. Um, and one of the issues with moving specialties back there, which is great in my book, is that they've been half moved back there. Yeah. And there's a lot of supporting services that are required, like yeah. on call presence from those teams that they don't have. I know for a fact that the wards are struggling with, you know, I'll put my hand up and I'm a senior team nurse that works across both sites. So I know that the nurses on all the wards that are now accepting ENT and plastics going patients are struggling. Yeah. Um, largely because they don't have any consultant or registrar cover from that specialty. Yeah. And the general surgeons are actually being tasked with discharging our patients. Um, so, which, yeah, is not ideal. And you've, like, you've got, sort of, I'm wondering if you're planning on opening more wards, are you planning on bringing over more consultants yeah. and registrars sort of back up? So that's why I said to care of the elderly, it won't happen tomorrow, but it will happen very shortly for that very reason. If we move a service, what we can't do is just use it as a dumping ground. Mm. Fremantle mustn't become that. It must become a hospital with its own identity, in my view. Uh, for the patient's sake, for the community's sake, and for the staff's sake. And also for the same reason as I said, you don't want to be looking after a general surgical patient one day and a guy in the next, etc. Mm. So for care of the elderly, we are very much planning to move almost lock, stock and barrel the whole service. So that will put the whole on call and everything else that goes with it. And we'd have to make sure those other range of services that are required to support it are there. With the elective part, what I'm looking to do is to try and create more of a 23-hour state-of-the-art elective service. A lot of cases now, what used to come in the hospital, remember the old carry-on doctor films? Patients would be running around the wards. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. Patients tend to be discharged back actually to their own homes because it's a better environment for them. And again, the healing process was often better if you were around your own family, etc., rather than isolating the hospital. And of course, hospitals have infections and other things that go around, not through just that cleanliness. It's actually because it's a sick environment. So as much as we can, we want to try and get what I call 23-hour stay surgery, which means that patients who come in for tonsillectomies or other things can actually come in Stay the 23 hour stay, you'll be within a very uh, specialist environment and then be discharged. But it must have all of that support and call, as you said. Because I think the truth is at the moment, or over time, it's kind of just been a little bit of a let's just move it there. Well, at the moment, the plan seems to be put in an ambulance and send it to the Anna's family. And Thompson yes. certainly needs to stay, as you would know, there's a six hour post op bleed yeah. time, yeah. Um, and they all are required to stay overnight. But what yeah. we're hearing is that in the morning, they're being discharged by general surgeons. Yeah, so if there's any ongoing problems post-operatively, there's not the specialist there to actually follow them up. Because the surgeons are only there until 6 o'clock at night and then they're gone. Yeah. So that move is largely around trying to put the day faces there. Okay? Yeah. Uh, as we develop the 23 hour, then we'll move more and more. But you're absolutely right, it's got to be the proper range of support. You had said to you earlier, safety is paramount. Sorry, Paul, just add on. Very timely, I actually had a, I had a uh, meeting yesterday with the head of general surgeon, all those heads of specialty around that exact issue. Mm -hmm. So we're actually trying to address that just for those really small number of multi day cases that do stay overnight. Yeah. Who's going to do the cover? What's the escalation point? What training do those nurses need in those handful of specialties that have come along? So that's only yesterday, literally, mm -hmm. um, but that's an issue that's been raised, so we're really keen to address it. So happy to talk to you afterwards. Yeah. Lady here now. I just like to ask a question specifically about nursing staff. If you're going to ex um, expand your services at Fremantle, when Fremantle actually, not closed, but the move was made to the understanding, many very experienced nurses took the dance set or went elsewhere. Um, 
And I just find if you're going to expand services at prenatal, where are you going to get the nursing stuff? Because a lot of people, like the old girls, are all retiring. We're going to the experienced staff, I'm sure, is what I'm saying. And then the hospitals are not taking as many graduate nurses in now that they used to. They've actually reduced their numbers of graduates. And I'm finding, I know, because I worked at the Fiona Stanley Turk until a year ago, that even on the floor where I work, in maternity, they're putting in, a, they're having a registered nurse and a nursing assistant on each shift. Um, you know, is that safe? You know, well, how we, are you going to, in, we, how are you, I just want to ask, sorry. how are you going to get the nurses right. and how are you going to ensure that there's safety on the floor? The so, the nurses, we worked the nursing hours for patient day. So, associate nurses can't count for that. Nursing assistants don't count for that. It has to be the right number of nurses per ward, as per the rules, and that's what I monitor daily. We become an employer of choice by making sure we're a good place to work, and we are doing lots of work around trying to make sure that happens. It won't happen overnight, uh, but we're working hard to make sure we are an attractive hospital for people to work at. Uh, we have been using agency as lots of hospitals have in the past. Again, we're actually recruiting our own pool of permanent nurses who will be deployed rather than using agency. That's another way through it. In terms of the services we move into Fremantle, it's about moving. We don't have an open checkbook. So what we're trying to do is balance the services across both sides. So what's appropriate for Fremantle and what's appropriate for Fiona? So it'll be a case of moving staff with their agreement to Fremantle, as in the same way as when Fiona opened, lots of staff moved from Fremantle to Fiona. So we'll try and do that. But getting the right numbers of staff, as you said, is critical. It's not only the right numbers, it's the level of experience. Oh, totally. Because you can have a ward with really sick patients and you can have most of the staff on graduate nurses or just at their graduate year. Well, again, we don't, we, we don't tend to try not to do that. What we do is we try to move our staff appropriately around. We try to make sure we have a sensible recruitment program where we know people are likely to be leaving. We're constantly trying to recruit towards us. But also by having our own pool, if you like, instead of agency, and she gives us far more flexibility. Thank you. Good evening. Sorry. Um, earlier you mentioned uh, that there's plans for uh, EMT and for gynecology. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there any opportunity, any potential for you to be, uh, to be able to give us some kind of um, timelines on the plans for that and, and the, perhaps in relation to the previous question about the staffing capacity. So ENT started already, uh, but we, what we've got to do is make sure we do that safely, as per your question. Gyne will be with it. I think Gyne has started, started as well now. So Gyne starting now. Right. But we'll end up probably with about half a dozen specialties, for the same reason I said earlier. If you have more than half a dozen, the theatre team then actually gets spread to, over two broader uh, number of specialties. And it's not not as good an outcome. So all we've got to do is make sure we get the right balance of specialties for outcomes, because it's the outcomes which is a critical thing for patients. So you don't actually have a timeline that you could um, well, present? Well, we're doing ENT now, and that will grow as we identify. We're already doing it. Yes. Uh, so Gyne we're already doing. But what we're doing is identifying those cases which are most appropriate. We're also trying to plan it so that the scheduling works for the limited number of theatres we have there, but the intention will be to occupy all of the theatre complex. And it's happening now. I mean, I, I envisage with probably about six months, it will be pretty much fully functioning. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I wanted to say, if you're going to move more elderly patients over, will it still be, I thought Fremantle would sub care now. Is it not? No. Can more wards be open then to facilitate that? Well, we'll we'll open as we need to, but there might be some other cohorts of patients we find which actually are better off in Fiona. What we've got to do is make sure it's the right patients in the right place for the right care. That's the that's the critical way I'm trying to judge it. Sorry. And one of the things that um, bothers many of you is that you walk into Fremantle Hospital at the moment, there's a lot of down at here and I think this is all very well to so we're going to increase the number of ENT clients or the number of guys and so on. But when is there going to be um, a revamp of the hospital? You clearly need some maintenance and also in terms of safety and maintenance that we can't just, you know, fill 
all the boys that have done it here. You know, we, we talk about safety, but I think you could have already addressed the issue. Well, maintenance being... Maintenance continues. And absolutely continues. What we can't do is operate in any areas or run any areas that are unsafe. Uh, the budget for a rebuild is out of my control. I, that, that's not within my gift. But what I have the responsibility for is make sure that whatever area I use is safe. Which is why we can't just open all of it, because some of the facility actually wouldn't be appropriate for direct acute patient care now. But a lot of it still is, and that's the areas we're using. Can I, Sorry. can I address that? Um, so another policy that might be took to the election, you might have seen, um, because we did try and get this out, but I don't think it really got the attention that it warranted in the community. You know, people, uh, as, as you say, um, uh, Liz, that if, when you walk in past Fremantle you know, Hospital, you can see it. You know, you can just see the, the physical neglect. And I, I, ne I never hear a bad thing about the care that occurs inside the hospital, but you can see uh, you can see that neglect. So we are, uh, as well as um, an urgent care clinic for Fremantle, we've also said that Fremantle would be part of the um, sustainable health review. So I guess that was the terminology, but the idea would be that as well as the sort of strategy that's going on in terms of the use of the hospital, that we could also make sure that there was a look at the, um, yeah, the management, the clinical work that's done there and the opportunities for special specialty services, and that sounds like it's being done. But is there surplus, I mean, my idea is that if there's surplus land there, can you basically use some of that surplus land and keep the proceeds within the hospital precinct? So if there is land or facilities there that are not being used, can we, can we use the resources from that, sell it essentially, maybe, and then use it within the hospital's precincts because it's not going to be possible to come up with extra money for a refurb of the hospital. Mm -hmm. But what's there now is probably um, probably not being utilised. Is that what you're talking about, Josh? Yeah. I think other tenants. Mm -hmm. other tenants. Oh, other no, tenants. that's a rental. That's lease rental. So that upsets that. my upsets my cost. It could be part of that. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, the, the rental leasing money, 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 money does come back, come back and that's reused. Yeah. Okay, so that doesn't go into a separate bank somewhere. That all gets reused for patient care. And I think what you're talking about is could we take any of the land that's not required, maybe sell it, we'll use those proceeds to build. To something. stay within the hospital place, to yeah. stay within Fremantle. Mm -hmm. So that is part of what we want to look at, is as well as the work that's being talked about here, to look at that whole footprint. Is there any capacity there? Is there anything surplus there that we can use in other ways, either either by selling it off or we just need to have a, a good look at it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but part of that would only would the, the resources for that would stay within Fremantle Hospital. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be stripped out by government and used somewhere else. So Roger Cook and I um, had a bit of a look around the hospital. We were quite limited in what we could do because we were in opposition. Um, but that's the overall picture. So I've got lady in the black, and I've got gentleman in the black, and the lady in the black. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying. Yeah, look, and I'd like to raise just a couple of issues, but that's one of my um, key highlights, and Sarah and Rachel Pavish and one of those councillors as well. And I definitely agree in terms of putting the lady land at Government Hospital and Colchester to better use. Many people wouldn't know, but the Wilson's car park directly across the road from the hospital is actually owned by the hospital. It's managed by Wilson's car parking, who overcharge you for parking and then, yes, you know, pay you to make charge for um, fine. But meanwhile, it's over owned by the hospital, it's not being put to much use, and you know, it could be sold off and redeveloped for something much more useful to invest in the hospital. Um, I, I, I heard you speak just prior to the closure of um, the ED and the opening of the owner's family, and you talked about the significance of the um, shutdown and the location being um, unparalleled to any other um, transfer that's happened in Australia in terms of the sheer scale of the shift of, of jobs and patients and, and activity and so on. And at the time, you know, we were kind of marvelling on the fact that, um, you know, there was no transition plan in terms of economic activity and local economy and, and that sort of thing as, as well. And, um, and we have seen a bit of a decline in that area. 
which, you know, some, some residents love because there's no longer the parking lot that everybody has. Um, and so I'm interested again in terms of some actual numbers, in, in terms of the number of um, employees, FTE equivalents currently there, um, compared to when it shut down, which I believe went down by two thirds of the staff. That I wasn't here, sorry, I don't know. And, and the number of patient beds. And just so that we can get yeah. some ideas yeah. of the relative scale. I can't remember the exact number, but we're currently a 300 bed facility, we're using about 230. I can't remember exactly, I was around, but I can't remember exactly what it was before. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be two thirds. I, I can tell you what the current FTE is, but I wasn't working it for our That's time. That's yeah, so Sorry, Ruth was there. Sorry, I should have asked Ruth. Ruth was there. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt, Harry, 60%. Sorry, I wasn't there. Yeah, yeah. And look, so I, I, I say that just mainly because I think there is a way to look at this and say, well, how I just make one point, and it's important though, and we have to just face the facts. But I shouldn't say this as much, our size is important. We've got to remember that actually there's only 10k in it away now. You've actually got a tertiary hospital for the most sickest of our residents. And we've got to remember that it wouldn't have been possible without some of that transfer. Yes. You wouldn't have had enough specialists to do that. So we just got to remember that all the time. What we're trying to do is make care as local as possible that's doable for the best outcome. But I suppose you're not actually hearing the other component. I agree, and I'm glad yeah. that you're cognizant of that. But um, I, the other element to that is that we've had this major contributor to our local you know, community yeah. this pulled out. And, and so I know, for example, in Notre Dame are uh, contemplating building a, a nursing um, education facility looking at, you know, extra stories in the West End that nobody really wants them to build. Um, you know, can they have a couple of floors? Well, that, that's <laughs> obviously going to be commercial negotiations, which yeah. we won't do here. Sure. But and I do get the economic, sorry, I do get the economic argument, but I have to tell you from where I come from. Yeah. If I give a patient a poorer outcome for something I could have changed, that's, that's what I'm about. I've got to get the best outcomes for patients. There's a whole load of factors I can't control. You know, the economy, housing, roads, transport. All I can do is try to make the services across both campuses the best they can be for those patients. And, and that, that, that's where I am. And we've got some of the most fantastic facilities locally now. You know, I, had a, I saw a lady uh, four weeks ago. She'd been flown in an hour away. She'd had a stroke. And within the hour, we got her in, we'd removed the clot. And the next day, she was sitting up ready to go. Now you would never ever have had that capacity if we hadn't made these changes. So we just got to, with all of the downside, all I'm trying to say is we've got to balance it with the upside. Okay, so gentleman is trying to get the back. Yes, um, I think this what we're saying is good, but I'd like to see some, some patience about making decisions and stepping back and having a look at what is best for community intervention style care as opposed to focusing enormously on, um, on uh, chromatic intervention right at the end. And inside the Fremont Hospital, I know I work at Fremont Hospital, yeah. I know that it's a, there's glaringly obvious things that don't matter. There is a ward there, the old current care ward, beautifully fitted out, all the plumbing, all the gas, and all that sort of stuff is in there, yes. and now it's used for administration for public health. Mm -hmm. So what is going on there? What, who, I mean, and, and, and people are proud of having done that. Surely there's going to be more patient-centered focus on how we use the resources for that hospital. So, absolutely agree with you. But again, we've just got to watch we don't get caught in the same trap as we've got this great facility that was used for something, we'd better never change it. We've got to use, no, I, I do get the point, but I'm saying we couldn't keep a full Fiona Stanley and a full Fremantle. There aren't enough, never mind the dollars, there aren't, bear with, bear, 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 bear with me, bear with me. We've got to try to get the right balance. What I've been honest about is we haven't got the right balance yet. I'm telling you that. I haven't got the time machine, which I spoke about. 
All I can try and do, and I've been there four months so far, is go through a process of making sure we're looking at everything we can do in the right location and doing it properly. We spoke earlier about EMT, about the danger of just moving them quickly, let's get it all back. It doesn't work for patients because if a patient goes off at night, there's nobody supporting them, it's dangerous. So we've got things wrong at the moment, and what I'm giving you an undertaking is we will, over the shortest period of time, go through all of those areas and try to look at what's the best use of that environment, but also more importantly, what's the best use of our people and the best for the patients. And that's all I can do. But that's why I haven't got an answer for that part. But I've got to go through a process. Sorry, I wasn't trying to diss it. But just, just to add to that, we are actually looking through what's going to be the best ward reconfiguration to try and put, perhaps put more and more into B block. So we are looking at what's the best wards, 8 South, 8 so. North. One of them is actually a really nice ward as well, had a lot of renovations. So we're looking at, okay, what can we consolidate where? We've got a bit of a mix at the moment. One ward's, you know, part surgical, part medical, another one's part ortho, part uh, ortho jerry. So how could we perhaps realign those a bit better to have a bit more continuity in some of the wards, plus put them in the best place possible? So they've been picked as trying to get it. Sorry, just going back briefly to building maintenance, a special case of real significance is the null, which is a significant heritage building. Have you got plans for the... Which one? I'm going to look at Rose. So which one's the null? The null with the original hospital in it. Does okay. It okay. It doesn't, yes, the heritage. So is that F block? Sorry? F block? Uh, no, G. G block. G block. Okay, yes, it doesn't need a code of paint. There's no specific plan of that at the moment. I think it's just got medical research foundation in it at the moment. But could it do with a lick of paint? Absolutely. Um, and again, it comes down to Paul saying, talking about what's the priorities at the moment. And I probably want to invest a lot more money in the patient areas as opposed to some of the non patient areas. I, I, I said I get so many dollars to spend. Um, if I went out and asked everybody to vote for me to give me more dollars in taxation, I suspect I'd probably not be elected. So we've got to live within the confines. We've got to use our resources to as much as we can look after our heritage, but most importantly, patient care. Yes, yeah. It will be important to tap into some of the heritage funding that's available yeah. through Absolutely. the Absolutely. And we will, we will do as much as we can around that, yeah. I promise. <laughs> Sorry, gentlemen, then, then the lady at the back. Oh, thank you. Um, on the uh, former Liberal um, I was uh, lucky to actually meet the director of nursing at Fremantle and uh, meet some of the staff and the executives as well as the front end. I must say, they're all lovely. There was a totally different feel about the hospital, although, yes, it does look old. It feels old. Different attitude there and then it was years ago when it was a general hospital with emergency. One thing I did find out about is that with the emergency gone, yes, I think the numbers were about 2,900. Employees that we down about a thousand, something like that. It's about 1,500. Yes, that's 200 FTA. About 1,900 drop. That's so, so it's quite a significant side. Uh, uh, economic level, it feels a bit harder. Yeah. On the other hand, it was said that the, without the emergency around, as you're aware, there are certain people that hang around emergency departments and the streets were a little bit easy to walk around after that. So there were a lot of people that were uh, a little bit more happy to get out of their homes around the general area. So I can appreciate the problem with emergency. Associate, and I really appreciate your cost issues. Um, and I really look forward to that. Hop, and I see the hospital developing really, really well. Um, but I suppose looking back on the economic side, as a non looking at that size of the hospital and looking at the non emergency, what sort of numbers could perhaps that hospital employ in the, in the distant future? Is there a the problem with that speculation is the speed of change in medical technology to be absolutely honest with you. Um, what we've got to make sure is we've got to always employ the right number of staff for those patients. But if I think about how we used to treat, let's go back to somebody with a stroke 20 years ago, and the number of staff to look after a patient with a stroke 20 years ago significantly more than actually it is now. Now it's more specialist, but over a much shorter period of time. So it, it's hard to just say in 10 years we'll have X number of people, five years even. The, the speed of change is just incredible to me. You know, every day I go in and I see something new popping up. So it's hard to predict those. Uh, but what we have to do is make sure, it's all, and I'm not trying to be trite, but it's just important we make sure we've got the right number of staff for the patients, rather than the total volume. The size isn't always everything. 
The most important thing in hospitals is your outcome, and making sure we get you the best outcomes that are possible in the world. And, and staff are a factor, but the numbers aren't necessarily the, the, the indicator alone. Sometimes they are, but not the only thing. Sorry, the lady at the next Yes, um, I understand fully that your role in which, which uh, particularly takes responsibility for the care of uh, patients and for the um, management of the, the staff employed there. Um, however, I do want to return to the previous questioner um, regarding the no, the building uh, that was referred to. Um, because that really is a responsibility of the hospital at the moment. Yeah. And it probably is a responsibility that we may, may not be competent enough to actually look after at this point in time. It has probably been neglected for a considerable period of time. And its heritage asset to the state is being lost consistently. That building was the uh, residence of the Controller General of the Fremantle uh, Convict Establishment. So its, its heritage goes back to the now World Heritage Listed prison uh, facility and it should be recognised for that, that connection to um, our social history and our cultural history. Its, its proper management needs to be relinquished if it is not going to be able to be funded through the health budget. So what we, what we are doing is review the whole campus. Part of it to see what buildings we'll never need again. Part of it to see which buildings are heritage. Part of it to see which buildings need some improvement, etc. Um, in the four months, I have to admit, it hasn't been my number one priority, but that's not to dismiss it. It is important. Um, but we've got to try and get everything done in a sequence. Otherwise, we'll fix one thing and realise actually we've done something wrong with it because actually it also affected BCP on the track. Often it's a domino effect through hospitals. So what we're trying to do is sequence it around the services that we need, the facilities that are needed for it, the staff that are needed for it, and that's how we'll play it through. You're absolutely right about heritage. Um, I mean, we've got to make sure it is maintained. We have no right to lose it. But it will be part of that whole overall review. So I'm happy to look into it. I, did, I said I, knew, I know about the number, I didn't know about the name. Uh, and I was actually in it today. Um, so I'm more than happy to take that away. And oh, yes. I'm just not across the dates. Paul's, Paul's talking about four months, I'm talking about two months. I've been on the show. Yeah. <laughs> I've been in health a long time, so I'm more than happy to take that away. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to recommend that you might like to liaise with the Green London History Society. Yep. Do you want to just touch my ass after? Yeah. That'd be helpful, thank you. John, will you try again? <clears throat> that was exactly why I wished to bring up. Um, it was the Director General's house before Fremantle Prison, before and during and after it was built. It is one of the most significant buildings in the yeah. state, and I agree that the health department isn't the right department to be looking after it. And I think that we need some seriously good advice as to what to do with it. And I think a third party will probably be the one to do it. Absolutely, 100%. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Just a, just a point of um, clarity. If in the future uh, the, the governments of today are able to reduce the debt that Western Australia has, you can know, bring, bring it up to the surface. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be a, a vision or a have potential if instead of looking at selling off little pieces of land up in that hospital and changing this and doing this and doing all that, to hold on to it? But it's been such a, a favourable object of service for probably 100 years or more. And if we do have the funds in a future day for knowing that the population growth will increase, the usage of those areas may be utilised. I think that's for the review that's to take place. Uh, that's not something I can answer this evening. Uh, we can all speculate about the future. Um, there are always upsides and downsides in transactions around hospitals with land. It's quite strategic. Um, I'm dealing with some at the moment around Fiona where there's a spare land around there and people are looking to, bit to use it. It's important that whatever decisions we take though are long-term decisions, not short-term. So I absolutely agree with you in terms of long-term decision making. All of those factors have to take, be taken into account. But I don't think it's a straightforward thing that could just be answered to kind of uh, standing on our feet. Right. The positive is, is that if, um, with 
Fiona Stanley being pretty much full, Rockingham's pretty much full. When the, as we have more activity, it's, this natural home's going to be Fremantle. So that's almost our vent to where, where the activity is going to go because it, it's almost too hard to give Fiona Stanley too much more activity because they're so full and Rockingham's pretty similar. So Fremantle having that capacity and infrastructure capacity is where I would imagine the health department will put additional activity when they've got the enough funding for them. Yes, sir. Um, the question by uh, I'd like to take you back to your introduction where you mentioned how our model hospital is very much like small towns. <clears throat> so we have here in Freeman a small town in the heart of a big city, of fairly big city, surrounded by the suburbs, some industrial, some environment, tourism, mm -hmm. all kinds of business. I think an expectation of the people who live in that area around it might be that in some way, that little, little town there should be able to deal with it on a 24 hour basis. Some kind of minor emergency on the streets, perhaps something industrial. Mm -hmm. As an expectation, those people might have. I know I do. Yep. I'm a resident. I'm not in the health industry, yep. but that's my expectation, which is why I welcome the new government. So the, uh, I absolutely, as I said to you earlier, it's about trying to make sure. There's locality where its best outcomes. I'm going to keep bringing us back to this today. Uh, when I was in the ED today, we had a gentleman who'd been rushed in from an accident in his workplace. Uh, he had secondary degree burns all over his body. If he'd been brought into Fremantle, um, his outcome would be pretty tight. Um, so it's about appropriateness. However, if it's somebody who's had a laceration of the arm, etc., then potentially that is doable. And as I said to you at the start, it's all about trying to make sure we get the right balance. But if you have a patient brought into an ambulance, it's not always obvious what that patient requires. And the very worst thing to do, for the sake of 10 kilometers, is to bring them to a place where they'll be unloaded, they'll be assessed, and then they'll die, or they'll be severely injured and unrecuperable, because they should have gone to a special center. And it's not always obvious. It, you know, medicine's an art, not a science. And it sounds strange, but it absolutely is. And it's about being able to get the right people around at speed to make that diagnosis and intervention. And if it was a member of my family, I say this honestly, who had a choice, being an ambulance, and potentially going to the wrong place, I'd probably move away from the area. I want the best clinical outcome for patients. But for, for things that are appropriate at a local level, 100%. But you can't always have everything on every town. It's just not possible. And nowhere in the developed world, everywhere in the developed world is facing uh, increasing costs. If you look at the spend of gross domestic product in Australia, I think it's about 9.6%, if my, my sums are about right. I think the average developed country is about 9.8%, 9.6, 9.8%. Go to France, it's up to 13%. The United States is just over 16%. Now, I can talk from UK numbers. Our gross domestic product, that's, that's the annual country's earnings, we spent 8.8. .8. Just to put us up to the average for the developed world would add two pence to income tax. So 23 to 25 pence. To get us to the United States would put up to about 55 pence in the pound. It's, it's a cost to having it as local as you want. There is also a people issue. As we said earlier, you know, you don't have necessarily everybody crying out to become a nurse or a doctor in their professions when they leave our universities. So we've got to balance everything up. But as local as we can, we have to do it. Or we'll make sure is it's still for the best outcome. Of course. Yeah. Sorry. Absolute collaboration between the government and ourselves. That's what employs me. 
Um, but I mean, yeah, specific right. to your time. If it's possible, that's what we'll do. It's just that there's a GP clinic now operating in the hospital, and we don't have access to their contract or their terms. Oh, okay. So if it were possible, that's what we'd like to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, because so, I think that makes sense. We're talking about capacity in the hospital, and that's a medical centre. Mm -hmm. That's the obvious place for it to be. Um, but we just need to clarify whether it's going to be possible in terms oh, okay. of the existing GP clinic. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I thought the GP clinic oh, was closed. Yes, uh, yeah, I think there are some services there, but I'm, I'm just not sure. So yeah. if that's not the case, then it might be straightforward. But by the time I speak to so again, the, the trick here, to be honest, there, there are multiple models of these urgent care centres, which I'm not very, very specific about. You, know, you can have ones which are purely nurse-led, you can have ones that focus on certain uh, presentations, you can have ones with actually GPs in attendance, you can have ones where there is uh, a general physician. There are multiple models around to look at. I mean, the, again, the trick is actually not to say there's one of those will happen. The trick is to say, actually, what does the population need? What are the people who would find it most useful? How do we structure it and build it? But, but it's got to be done in the balance of everything. But, uh, I mean, if, if it could be located at the hospital, it probably would make sense. But equally, I've actually run them in other places where they've actually not been part of hospitals and been hugely successful. So it's again about finding the right balance. I, think, which I suspect if, if there's any way we can operate at the hospital, yeah. I think that would be the preference because we're saying that we've got capacity at the hospital and it would make, it would make sense to use that capacity. Yeah. So if that's at all possible, that's yeah. what it would be. But again, right capacity. If it's the top ward, <laughs> people walking upstairs, or lifts, etc. So we just, I think we work together to, to make sure it works really well. What we want to do is whatever we put in has to be the best for it for everybody. And that's what we get it. So I guess the government hasn't been in long enough to have those very detailed discussions with us yet, but no doubt the minister's going to go to the health department and then come to us to have those discussions. So we don't have any particular more insight apart from the policy that's out there. So we're assuming that those conversations are going to happen relatively soon. Um, is this possible for the Alma Street Clinic as well, or is that from the trip? What? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of the, the some of the social issues that are quite apparent in Fremantle yeah. and um, obviously mental health has a massive yeah. role to play in that. I suspect we get more than our fair share partly because people are drawn to this area for that facility. I'm just wondering if we can work more on yeah. trying to better manage the spill out into the street. So we're actually looking at that whole facility and is there a better location at the moment. I can't go into too much detail, um, but actually that's something that's across the desk all the time. So we're looking at that for that very reason. Yeah, and also just you know, I mean, they used to have pet teams and that sort of yeah. stuff because like, oh, somebody's having yeah. problems. You know, there's a few regular like if you had someone to call to help them. Yeah. That's so we're looking at that. Mm -hmm. I said I can't say it today because actually there's still some things to fine tune, but it shouldn't be too long before we have a solution. Yeah, that's fine. Yes. I know it's too surprised, but I guess mm -hmm. for some of the hospitals for here and some hospitals, do they come under the same budget or if they cross the top of the So no, I, I have one budget. Um, I devolve my budgets into local areas, so I try to get the authority for those budgets uh, to be pushed down as local as possible to the services. So there, I do divide my budget between Fiona and Fremantle, but then I also subdivide it between surgery and medicine. I send about it. I already have one budget, okay. Okay. so okay. that's just how I divide it through.